But uh, we have figured out a way to bypass that. So Jimmy is doing a Facebook by phone tonight. So those of you who are watching, we're so thankful that you're able to join with us. And uh, we have moved it around a little bit. So hopefully you will have volume. I know last Sunday morning we did the same thing, but it wasn't a good volume. Last week, as we came on Wednesday night, we were talking about some very important stuff. All the Word of God is important. How many of you can say amen? amen. amen. Last week was one of my favorite teachings, and, and this week uh, comes right in really close to that. But last week was chapter 19 in Revelation, and as you can see, we're getting close to the end of the book. Praise the Lord. And we're getting close to the end of the book. And we're getting close to the end of the book. Amen. Yeah. The more that we see, the more that we realize Jesus is coming back. And I'm looking for the rapture of the church just about any time. But last week, we talked about the marriage supper of the Lamb. We talked about, uh, I, I kind of got a preach spirit on me. And, and uh, we, we got into the dating process of the old Jewish customs and, and the, uh, uh, the marriage and, and how that they would uh, do everything in the uh, uh, old customs of the Jews and how that it was everything lined up with the scriptures. So we talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb, we talk about the second coming of Jesus, we talk about the battle of Armageddon, and then tonight we're coming into chapter number 20. Chapter number 20, it's November the 22nd, and can you believe it? Tomorrow is Thanksgiving, and we have tonight had a wonderful time already. Before we turn Facebook on, we have been talking with everybody here in the sanctuary and so many wonderful things that people are thankful for. Most of us are more thankful than anything that the presence of the Lord is in our lives, that the presence of the Lord is here tonight to minister to help us and I, I actually just feel like I can't get away from it so I might as well just go ahead and do what I feel like doing and I know I'm walking away from Facebook but I'll be back just in a minute. A few weeks ago I preached a message on the light and how that God uses us to take the light to people. I have two of these little lanterns left over and I want to Give these two little lanterns to somebody that is going to be needing them over this Thanksgiving holiday. If that is on your heart, if God's laid it on your heart, I want you to come on up and give. If you know somebody and you want to share good news with the gospel of Christ to somebody, you come up and give these and uh, present them to somebody in your family. I believe that's going to speak to somebody. Chapter 19 ended with the second coming of Christ and the battle of Armageddon. Now in chapter 20 becomes one of the most strongly debated chapters in the Bible. So many people have so many different opinions on chapter 20. But I believe, I believe that the scripture is fairly clear on chapter 20. I believe that some of these folks are getting so mixed up, and we'll look into that just a little bit. But sometimes, if we don't take the Word of God literally, if we try to put parentheses around everything, or we try to let it be a parenthetical statement, or we try to make it sound two or three different ways, it gets us confused. But I'm going to read tonight, beginning in verse 1, and read to verse 10, and then we'll come back and kind of unpack some of it. But before we do that, I want to go before. Lord in prayer. I want us to pray. I'm going to ask you again to put your hand on your heart. Those of you that are watching my Facebook, if you would just put your hand on your heart and let's pray that the Lord would help us to open up. And I know this bumper that's on the inside of our chest is not where we're thinking, but I know that the Spirit of the Lord lives on the inside of us and we're talking about the heart of man. We're talking about the heart of the Spirit. That's the one that God deals with. That's the one that God touches. That's the spirit. We are a spirit being. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight for the great opportunity that you give us. Once again, Lord, you're allowing me to stand before your people and open up the book of life. I thank you, Lord, that the book of life, Lord, 
this precious book called Your Words. Lord, not the book that our names are written in, but not the word that you wrote. Because in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. And this book that we know brings life to us. And then in this book we find the way to life. We thank you for those words. God, we're asking you tonight to open up our spirit and let the word come into us. And let it bring life into our spirit. And let this book of life bring living words of life into us. And let us live and be and do what you call us to do. Lord, we thank you for this Thanksgiving season. We thank you for all that you are and all that you've done and all that you're going to do. And I pray for all of our families, God, that's listening and that's seeing and that's hearing this message tonight, this teaching tonight. I pray that as we are with our families, God, that you will open up opportunities for us to be able to love more than we ever have. To be able to be a light more than we ever have. And let the light shine through us, oh Jesus. Open our hearts tonight and teach us from your word. And we'll be eternally grateful in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. 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 The church said, Amen. Chapter 20, the first thing we're going to look at is the millennium. What is the millennium? What does the millennium mean? We'll come back to that in a moment. Then I saw an angel. Chapter number 20, verse number 1. Then I saw an angel, John said, coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon. Can anybody say hallelujah? <laughs> he laid hold on the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. I say hallelujah again. He did shut up. Praise the Lord. And he set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus. And for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. That's pretty clear. I'll go get messed up and mixed up with that. Verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who was part in the first resurrection. Let me read that again. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Then, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. God and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and forever. So John sees an angel. Let's break this down a little bit now and talk about it down through verse number 10, and then we'll pick up with the rest of the chapter. But John sees an angel coming down from heaven with a great chain in his hand. Can you imagine that angel? I really can't imagine if that's an angel or if that is the Son of God. The Bible says it's an angel, but in many instances, the Son of God is referred to as an angel. In many other instances, we see messengers or people like you and I that are referred to as angels. So we really don't know, and I've not yet been able to read any person that actually knows. I've read a lot of commentaries, a lot of folks that commentators that have talked about this and they don't really know who this angel is but can I say that I believe it was Michael that even when 
Satan was contending with the body of Moses. You remember back in the Old Testament? And he said that, that he, and, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember exactly the words, but what he was saying was, I'm coming in the authority of Jesus. I'm coming in the authority of God. I'm not going to, I'm not going to rebuke you in my name. In other words, I don't have the authority, Satan, to rebuke you in myself. I'm coming through the name of Jesus or through the name of God. And so, I'm not sure who has the authority to bind that rascal, but I'm glad that somebody does because God gives somebody, some angel, someone, some personality has the authority to come down from heaven with a great big chain that's strong enough to grab him. Did you notice that the, the angel seizes the dragon? That means he gets a hold of him. I believe he gets him by the neck. Praise the Lord. The word he gets a hold of him at, he grabs him, and the Bible says that he's going to chain him up. The angel seizes the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and binds him for a thousand years. So those of you that are going through some rough waters right now, those of you that are going through some attacks and some heartaches and some pain, those of you that are going through some things and Satan is rearing his ugly head, and sometimes does Satan ever say to you, if you were really saved, would we have to go through this? Has anybody ever heard that or is it just me? Does anybody hear the, 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 the enemy speaking to you and him saying, if you were in God's will, you would be facing this? And all of a sudden, we understand that the accuser of the brethren is speaking against us. He's trying his best to discourage us. And so when Satan does that, and we can just simply repeat to him what the Word of God says, one of these days, oh boy, your end is going to be rough. One of these days, you're going to come to a, a, a bad surmise. You're going to come to a bad place. And one of these days, all of your dragging and all of your mouth is going to be shut. The Bible says it's going to be shut up. So this angel throws him into the abyss, then shuts and seals it so he cannot receive the nations anymore until the thousand years are finished. So what's going on in this thousand years? Let me say first off, the thousand represents the millennium. The millennium is a thousand. That represents a thousand of our years as we know it. It's not a thousand of God's years. It's a thousand of our years. And the Bible says that a thousand uh, years with God is as a day in the days of a thousand years. So this is a thousand, I believe, of our years. And as a thousand years go by, you and I are going to be ruling and reigning with Christ on the face of this earth. This earth right here. The Lord is going to have a lot of cleaning up to do. There's going to be a lot of stuff that you and I are going to have to manage that we're going to have to be in charge of. And if we're ruling and reigning with Christ, let me just go back just a little bit to previous chapters. And, and you all know that two-thirds, basically, of the earth's population is going to be laid dead. You all know that the Lord already told us that he's going to summon the great eagles and all the vultures and all the birds, and it's going to be a mess. Can you, have any of you watched the, the bombing uh, uh, of, of Hamas and over in, in, in the West in, in the West Bank and, and all of everything that's going on in Gaza Strip? Have you all looked at any of that stuff? Have you seen what a destructive mess that it is? Can you imagine what it's going to look like after the Battle of Armageddon when the whole earth and all the armies of the earth have come together to fight against the Lord of Lords? And, and, and there's going to be such destruction and such humanity that's going to be dead, and it's going to take a long time just to bury the dead and just to clean up the dead. There's going to be a lot of stuff after the wall. There's going to have to be a lot of supervisors that are equipped to do God's work and God's name. And guess what? We are the supervisors. You say, Brother Dad, I've got in mind that I'm going to go fall around on a little white cloud and I'm going to rub cream cheese on nothing and that's what I'm going to do for eternity. Hey, that's not what it's all about, God. Yes, there remains a rest, the Bible said. Yes, we get to rest with the Lord and when we're in the presence of God, it's going to be a rest for the soul because no longer do we have to contend with the enemy. No longer do we have to have strife and struggle and all this kind of stuff that we're having to have. No more help. No more issues with family. No more situations like that. It's all a done deal, and all we have to do 
Lunchables. Can you imagine a little child petting a, a tiger? Can you imagine a little, little child having a pest of, of a lion? Uh, my goodness, it's going to be amazing. But this is going to be the time that the Lord is going to rule from the city. I'm talking about the city of Jerusalem. Whatever the ordinances are, whatever the GPS location of the city of Jerusalem is, that's where the Lord is going to be. It's always been stated in Scripture. It's not a, it's not a mythological thing. It's not a figment of somebody's imagination. The Lord was born in a place called Bethlehem. That's on the map. The Lord ascended into heaven from a place called the Mount of Olives. That's on the map. I got to stand there. I got to be there. I got to look at the Eastern Gate. I got to think about the word of the Lord that says the next time that that thing is open, it's concreted up right now, but the next time it opens, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is going to walk through that thing. It's a literal place. It's not somewhere off in fairyland. It's not somewhere off in another universe. It's right here on planet Earth, and this stuff is going to happen right here. Now, I know after the thousand-year reign, the Lord's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Everything's going to be remade. It's all going to be different. That's all cool and well. But listen, we've got a long time to go to the beautiful future before we get to that. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. So the word millennium is Latin for 1,000 years. These verses are among the most controversial in the book of Revelation, or in the whole Bible, really. Next, John sees thrones, and those seated on them who have been given authority to judge. Authority to judge. This probably refers to the 24 elders who represent the church. 1 Corinthians 6 and 2 is a reference that I chose to put in here because I feel like that that gives us a good idea. I mean, 1 Corinthians 6 and 2 says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Don't you see? The Word of God meets itself. The Word of God, it, it, it complements itself. It always agrees with itself. And if you're headed down an angle in the Word of God, if you're thinking something about something that you just read, look in the Word of God and make sure that it agrees with your thinking. If you hear a commentary, and this commentary says, you know, this does and the other, Make sure that he's got scripture to back that up, and that he's not just taking one verse and taking it and with it. We've got to have the word of God that has to complement itself, has to be in all agreement. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world, and if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? And yes, I know that that's dealing with a situation that was happening back at that time in the Corinthian church. But we see a future truth coming here. We see a future prophecy that's coming from the apostles' writings here. We see that God is saying through the apostle, the saints are going to judge the world. And yes, he's reprimanding a group of people in the church that can't even get their act together between one another on how they're supposed to live. But he's saying, if you guys can't do this, how are you going to be able to judge the world? How are you going to be able to judge the people? of the whole world. So that's how the Bible ties together. It all complements each other. The Bible doesn't explain how the saints who are co-heirs with Christ will participate in this judging the lost world. John also, the Bible says, sees the souls of those who have been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. These have not worshipped the beast or his image or received the mark of the beast on their foreheads or on their hands. So along with believers of all time, they have been resurrected to reign with Christ for a thousand years. However, John comments that the rest of the dead will not be resurrected until the thousand years end. Then he writes, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection, over such the second death has no power. So what are we studying about all of these resurrections? I forget that I've got to stay still. So you folks on Facebook, forgive me if I get out of the picture. I know that thing's limited in how wide that it can go because it's right in front of me. But listen, when we're talking about the first resurrection, we're talking about the people who died in Christ, and 
those that are alive and remain that shall be caught up together to be with the Lord, and so shall they ever be. In 1 Thessalonians, it talks about that. That is the first resurrection. Who else included in that? Everybody that's dead that believed in Jesus. Everybody that was born again. Everybody from the beginning to the time of the first resurrection that trusted in Jesus. Those folks are resurrected to be reunited with their bodies. Some of us that are still alive and remain will be changed instantly. We don't have to reunite with our body. This body that we have, I believe, will put on immortality according to the Word of God. This mortal shall put on immortality. And those of us that are still alive, we're going to go up together to be with the Lord. But just before that happens, just a split second before that happens, those that are in the ground are going to come out. They're coming out of the grave. The grave can't hold them down. Our city, are you listening tonight? There ain't no power to hold this body down. One of these days, at the first resurrection, the first resurrection, I can't get that out enough because people have confused it. Really bad. But at the first resurrection, all the dead in Christ will come out of the ground and will go to heaven to be with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. But at the just after the first resurrection, we're going through what the Bible calls the seven-year period of tribulation. I said we're going through. The world is going through. We're not. Those that are included in the first resurrection are going to be with Jesus in the air. We're going through the seven-year tribulation period here on earth, but those that have been resurrected are going to be with Jesus in heaven for the marriage supper of the Lamb. We talked about that last week. Then, when the seven years have finished, those of us that have gone on to be with the Lord in heaven, we're coming back with the Lord in the clouds. We're coming back with Him. And He's going to say, this is the second coming now, not the second resurrection. This is the second coming. The first coming is when Jesus uh, when Jesus comes to the, to the air, in the atmosphere, and we go up to meet Him. That's the rapture of the church, the first coming. The second coming is when Jesus comes back, sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, and the earth begins to shake and tremble. The Mount of Olives is split in two. All kinds of things happen in the spirit as well as in the natural. And this is the first resurrection. A thousand years go by. Remember now, we talked about the battle of Armageddon. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. We talked about the battle of Armageddon. We talked about how the, 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 the false prophet. We talked about how the, the Antichrist is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. So then, at the end of the battle of Armageddon, here we are. We're talking about Satan. John sees an angel come down and he binds Satan. This is at the end of the battle of Armageddon. At the beginning of the millennial reign, Satan is bound for a thousand years. So a thousand years, Satan can't do anything. He can't tempt anybody. He can't push anybody's buttons. He has to keep his mouth shut. He's bound up in a, in a, in a pit. He's, he's bound up in a chain. So we have the first resurrection, and we have all of those that have died in Christ. I'm trying to be clear on this. And they are living and ruling with Christ. They're ruling on the face of this earth with Christ. Those that died in their sins, if you have family members, Let's go all the way back to the, the World War I, World War II. If you have, if you know of people, let's, let's talk about Hitler for a minute. That's a figment in a lot of people's minds that we don't know about Hitler. We don't know about his soul. But all the indications said that Hitler died lost. We don't know that, but I'm not trying to judge you tonight, but I'm saying if Hitler died in his sins, he was against the Jewish people. He hated the Jewish people. He hated anybody. And it was not for Nazism. He hated the world. He hated anything that didn't give him praise. So let's go back then to Hitler and let's say that if Hitler didn't receive Jesus, Hitler is still in this holding place called Hades. In this holding place is the place that I believe the rich man opened up his eyes in Luke chapter 24. He, the Bible says he lifted up his eyes, being in torment.
torments. He was in a hot place. He was in a place where there's no water. He was in a place where there's fire. But he was not in the lake of fire. So let's break this down just a little bit. This is where so much confusion comes from. You say, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. Well, that's true, but there are levels in both places. Can I hear an amen? I believe there are levels in both places. If there were not, Jesus wouldn't say that you can get these crowns. Those are levels of blessing. Jesus wouldn't say that we're going to be rewarded with being able to be over people. And throughout history, we see the Lord's process and the Lord's plan. He put some in charge of 50, some in charge of 100, some in charge of 1,000. The Lord distributed authority. That was God's plan. It was God's will. So that's what's going to happen in eternity. So here we are in the millennium reign. During the millennium, at the end of the battle of Armageddon, the false prophet, the Antichrist, was thrown into the lake of fire. This is a different place. That's their eternal abode. This is not Hades. This is not the keeping place of the dead, those that are dead, uh, not in Christ, that have died without Christ. So they are placed in the lake of fire. They'll be there forever. There's no escape, no getting out. Satan is placed in a holding, the Bible calls it an abyss. He's placed, he's chained into this location. He can't get out. This is not the lake of fire. This is a place where he's confined. You know, the Bible talks about in many places about angels being underneath the Euphrates River. It talks about angels being in the great abyss. There's a place that the Lord has that he can put people in. Satan is chained and put in this location. But get this now, just for a minute here. Remember, we're in this thousand year period. No Satan, no evil angels, no demons, no, no bad stuff. Jesus is ruling and reigning on planet Earth with his Christians, with his people. We're ruling and reigning. But then the Bible says, after the thousand years, Satan will be loose for a short season. But that short season is up. I'm, let, me, let me go ahead and read some, some more here. I'm about to get rid of I'm about to get ahead of myself. So, then he writes, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy, verse 6, is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. So, if you are only born once, you'll have to die twice. Does that make sense to anybody? But if you're born twice, you only have to die once. And some of us might not ever even die at all, but we'll be changed. We'll be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. So the flesh, in that instance, will be dead, will be consumed. So you will be part of the second resurrection and will suffer the second death if you've only been born one time. If you only came out of your mother's womb, that's the only birth that you ever had. But remember when Jesus said to Nicodemus, He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Born again. What does that mean? That means you have to be born twice once of the flesh, once of the spirit. So if you're born twice, you don't have to die twice, you only die once. These are also blessed. Who is blessed? The ones that are able to participate in the first resurrection because they will be priests of God and of Christ and they'll reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years end, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth. The four corners refer to the four main points on the capital, on the compass, north, south, east, and west. That's what that's talking about. As stated in verse number three, Satan will be set free at the end of the millennium to deceive the nations. Who are these who are deceived by Satan? Does anybody know who we're talking about? Who is it that's deceived by Satan when he is set loose for a short season at the end of the thousand year period? You might say, Brother Dale, what is God thinking? When Satan is tied up, why don't 
we get his tail thrown in to the lake of fire and never be thought of again. But God has a plan and a purpose in everything. Listen to me close. There are going to be people that are going to be born in that thousand year span that are mortal individuals. Remember we said that we will be immortal. Do you remember that? Do you know what immortal? You know what the difference between immortal and mortal is? Mortal human beings is what most of us are here tonight. There are some immortal ones that are here, but you can't see them, praise the Lord. If you did see them, you'd probably fall out and then you'd be immortal. Yeah, really. <laughs> but really, what we're talking about is those of us that are sitting tonight are mortal human beings. When we're changed, this mortal shall put on immortality. What does that mean? No longer are we flesh. We're a spirit being. Yes, we will have a body. It won't be like this body, exactly. It'll be like the body that the Lord Jesus had after he was resurrected. You want to know what you're going to look like, how you're going to be? Look at how Jesus was after he was resurrected. He could eat. He could think, he could speak, he could talk, he could also walk through the wall <laughs> and be in heaven one minute and on planet Earth the next. I am excited about my future body. I'm going to be tall, dark, and handsome, and I'm going to zip like the speed of light. Hallelujah! All because of Jesus. So let's get into this just a little deeper here. I know it's confusing. But as stated in verse 3, Satan will be set free at the end of the leading to deceive the nations. And who are those who are deceived by Satan? So when we go into the millennium, when we start this thousand year reign, there's going to be normal, mortal people that survive the tribulation period. There are going to be people that don't die. Actually, if you wanted to put a number to it, you could probably sit and think and not come up with an exact number, but you probably could come up sort of close if you do some specifics. Some specifics such as, right now they say there's about 8 billion people on planet Earth that are living right now. So, if you walk through Revelation, you see at one point in time, a third of the population of the Earth is killed. You see, at another point in time, a half of the population of planet Earth is killed. How many does that leave? That leaves one-third of the population. So what's one-third of eight billion? I'm not trying to put numbers together. I'm simply trying to give you an idea of what we're looking at here and who these people are that the Bible says is a great, large number from the north, south, east and west. This great number is the number of those that didn't die during the tribulation period. So, if you're with me so far in that, now, those people that went into the great tribulation, and by the way, out of that 8 billion people, we have the rapture of the church that place. So, I don't know how many that's going to be, and you don't either, but I pray and believe that you and I are going, so we won't be here, we won't be in that 8 billion number, that one third and one half die off of because of the tribulation situations. But when those people die, they're gone. They're, they're gone. They're in this uh, dead category. The, the dead, not in Christ, but the dead without Christ. Because unless they accepted Jesus, and if they did, they're going to be... Uh, they're going to be resurrected out of that. So let's, I'm, I'm getting off in a thousand different trails here. My mind's going to be a different way. Let me try to refine it down just a little bit. When Satan is loose, the people that were born and the people that went into the tribulation period have lived for a thousand years. Remember, if you go reference it out in the Bible, the Bible talks about how the baby will die at a hundred. So what's happening? In the tribulation period, the curse is reversed. Did you hear me earlier? That long lifespan comes back that we used to read about in the Old Testament. Remember how old was Methuselah? He was an old dude. He lived, he stayed around for a long time. People are going to be that way and we're going to make him again. So people are going to have young ones for years and years and years and years. And for a thousand years, multiplication factor of 
the human race, the mortal human race, is going to multiply. And so then, those folk that were born and that went into the thousand year uh, millennium reign of Christ, how would they, at the end of their life, their mortal human beings, how would they, remember, they haven't been tempted by Satan for all these years. How would it be right for them when it comes time for them to stand before God? The Bible says it's appointed unto man and wants to die. And after that, the judgment. Are you with me? So is this clear enough? Yeah. Yeah. After this, the judgment. So these dudes and gals that have been born here in this thousand year old day of rain, if Satan were not turned loose at the end of the millennial reign, how would they have an opportunity to either accept Christ or deny Christ? They wouldn't. Because Satan would not be that. But here he is. We find him being released. And once again, he's coming about with his deceptive power and with his trying to connive and trying to convince people. And believe it or not, he gathers a huge army together. Can you imagine people being so stupid? Can you imagine people living under the reign and the rulership of Jesus Christ? in the natural from the city of Jerusalem. You could go see him. He's going to be in the natural. He's going to literally be there in the city of Jerusalem reigning from the throne of King David. He's going to be sitting there and people are going to see him and know him and never be tempted by Satan until the end of the thousand years. And many, many Countless, the Bible says countless people are going to follow him. Have, have you followed me so far? Yes. Are you with me? It's 8 27. I've got three minutes <laughs> So these folks will be descendants of those who will survive the tribulation, the inner the millennium, and the natural body. Satan will gather those that he deceives, called God and made God. The name God is used in Scripture as a title for an enemy of God's people, according to Ezekiel. 38 and 39 this battle, and the one described in Ezekiel had particularly nothing to do in common except the names. God is used in verse 8 to describe the human leader of Satan's forces. May God refers to the people from all nations who rebel against Christ. May God is a huge army numbering like the sand of the sea. John sees God in May God surround the camp of the saints and the beloved city, which is Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be the capital of Christ's government throughout the millennium. When God and Magog surrounds Jerusalem, fire comes down from heaven and devours them. After the destruction of his armies, the devil, who deceives them, is thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they have been there. Listen to this. God, God not, not, not miss this. They have been there for the past thousand years. Who's been there? The false prophet and the Antichrist. Remember, at the beginning of the millennium, they were thrown into the lake of fire. We mentioned a while ago, that's their final abode. That's the last place. They never get out of there. They're there. They're judged. They're there. The judgment has already been pronounced on. After the destruction of his armies, the devil who deceived them is thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur with the beast and false prophet are been there for the last thousand years. The unholy trinity meets the Lord living, where they will be tormented day and night for all eternity. And then after the millennium comes the great rock from judgment. And I wish that we could get into that tonight, but we're going to have to carry it over. I had hoped to cover that tonight, but I can't do it. It's 8.30. Would you stand with me tonight? We'll pick back up Revelation chapter 20, verse number 11. Next week, Lord willing, my prayer tonight that each of us are ready to meet Jesus. Because before Thanksgiving Day, Jesus may come. Before Thanksgiving Day, the rapture of the church may happen. And when I say Jesus may come, I am not talking about the second coming of Jesus. So many people have misunderstood that. So many people have gotten that out of children, and it messes everything else up because it don't line up 
when we look at it that way, it gets things out of tune. Because if this if the rapture of the church was the second coming of Jesus, then we'd have to go into the thousand year reign. There wouldn't be time for the millennium, there wouldn't be time for I mean for the uh, the, the seventieth week, the tribulation. It gets everything mixed up. So when Jesus comes back, the next time Jesus comes back, he's not coming to this earth. He's coming to cloud level. Yep. The Bible says we'll go up together to meet, to meet him in the clouds. We're going up to meet him in the clouds. It's important that you understand that. A lot of people are looking today for the Antichrist. Don't look for the Antichrist. Look for Jesus Christ. He's coming to those that are looking for him. I don't believe the Antichrist will be revealed on planet Earth until the church is gone. I believe as soon as the church is gone, the church is the one that's holding back the forces. The Holy Spirit through the church is holding back the forces. And when that is gone, when the, when the church is gone, hell is going to be released and everything is going to happen. The Antichrist is going to be recognized and he'll walk up to our Father. We love you. I want to keep on going, Lord, but we got to quit. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for every person that you sent by this way tonight. Lord, thank you for our Facebook friends, those that are watching tonight. I pray a blessing over them. I pray that each home enjoys Thanksgiving if you tarry until tomorrow, Lord. That there be peace in the homes. God, that the joy of the Lord walk into the home and that people will feel the joy and the peace and the love of God. That people will be thankful for the great goodness of a loving Heavenly Father. That sent His Son to die for each of us. That we too could be saved and wouldn't have to go through tribulation and pain and all the suffering that's coming for this earth. Lord, we love you. We bless you. We pray for your people. Keep us in the palm of your hand. In Jesus' name, and the church shouted, Amen.